Thank you, Judge. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I'm gonna try to walk around to try to keep you awake. All right, I'm, and I'm gonna wave my hands a little bit, and uh, I'm not gonna jump up and down. I'm not gonna make you do a cheer. Um, but I do think the cheer was a great idea. So, Mike, good job. All right, so um, good news and bad news. Uh, bad news first, I have a bunch of slides. The good news is I'm gonna get rid of a bunch of them uh, by clicking through them really quickly. Uh, because we heard a lot of this stuff already today, right? So I was gonna go. I was gonna give you a little bit of an overview of um, of the problem, and then uh, kind of talk about the three waves. We've gone through the three waves, right? We talked about all that. We talked about how bad the problem is. Um, we also have talked about sort of the the fact that it's changing over time, right? And you're gonna have access to all these slides, so don't worry about it. You're not gonna miss anything really significant. This is just epidemiology that. We all kind of know already, so um, I want to go through a little bit of this. You know where the you know where the drug trends are, right? We've seen all of this. Uh, if you haven't seen this particular article, Jalal um, uh, Bukinich and and Roberts and and uh, basically they're out of Don Burke's shop at University of Pittsburgh. It's an amazing article it was in the journal Science last year in October, but it basically proves that the overdose epidemic is exponential in growth all the way back to 1995. We have a little bit of an improvement uh, in the past year. You've already heard about this today, so I'm not. I'm going to skip this. Now, I wanted to start here. Methamphetamine, right behind this one. It's right behind the the wave that we that we're seeing with respect to opioids. And, and I was talking uh, with Tommy Farmer uh, at lunch today, and and really. Um, he pointed out something very important, which is that we've seen methamphetamine or amphetamines or stimulants come behind opioid waves before. It's happened a couple of times. It's happened, uh, it happened after, uh, for example, after Vietnam, and it happened after uh, one of the world wars and so on. So this actually may have been predictable, but what this shows, what this slide shows is uh, basically an 82% increase in methamphetamine positive urine drug screens in, in, among people in methadone clinics in the past six years, right? And that's our, that's our lived experience right now with our clinic. So um, yeah, it's coming. And so we're really dealing with substance use disorder. We're not really dealing with opioid use disorder. We have this fourth wave coming. We've already covered that. So, that's, so basically that's my preamble to tell you what I really wanna talk about today is this university um, community connection, right? to begin to, to uh, help drive some solutions to the problem. And um, we've been working on that in Northeast Tennessee for, for a couple of years. Um, and in the process of doing so, have learned a lot about stigma. And when I say stigma, I mean stigma about substance use disorder, also stigma about medication-assisted treatment, Stigma about are people in medica using medication assisted treatment actually in recovery or not? There's stigma associated with um, 12 step programs sometimes and, and, uh, and also within uh, the recovery community. And so we got to work to get along, right? Because we need to create a recovery system that is going to work for, for everybody. And so we got widespread public stigma, and adults with drug dependence are consistently most, among the most stigmatized. And we know that there is significant stigma um, about MAT. And, you know, it, the best thing I know of to do relative to this at this point is get to know each other. And, you know, we talked about the, absent, the, the opposite of addiction being community, right? We can form that, own, that community among ourselves too, right? We don't have to battle with each other. And, and uh, we don't have, I mean, that, that, that it's counterproductive. And so the point that I'm trying to make is let's sit down and learn about each other and learn about the perspectives that, that, uh, that we um, have in common and because most of us are trying to do the best thing possible for folks that we serve, right? <clears throat> so I have, uh, I brought some evidence. This, this, is, this is called a Cochrane Review. And it basically a summary. It's a summary of uh, of the summaries, and in some cases, and, or a summary of the clinical trials relative to medication assisted treatment. And this this is uh, particularly for methadone, and it says, okay, yeah, it's good. 
It's real good. And, and a summary of, of even all that evidence is a great summary is that uh, National Academies of Science, um, uh, Engineering and, and uh, Medicine report that Michael King spoke about earlier. It's fantastic. It's downloadable. It's 275 pages, so don't print it. But uh, uh, if you want a really good anchor for being able to respond to folks as well as for your boat, uh, you could print it out and you could I'll probably hold something in place with it. But it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a sturdy report of all the evidence relative to MAT. So methadone's good, buprenorphine's good. Um, here's a difficulty. When people come off of these drugs for recovery, when they're, out, when they're in treatment, their risk for overdoses is, is not as high as when they are out of treatment, okay? So the, basically these tall bars are when people are out of treatment. And so what we're trying to do is keep people engaged with treatment so they can heal, get their brains healed over time and begin to make those uh, decisions uh, for recovery um, long term. And, I mean, that's the whole goal. So um, I, I, I put the MAT slides in just for the purpose of just trying to stimulate the conversation because in big forums, big forums like this, you, you wind up having a lot of different stakeholders uh, at the table. Some are going to be MAT, some are going to be abstinence only. Come on, let's just have a conversation and let's, let's begin to find some middle ground. And let's also do what's right for each patient, right? I mean, that's, that should be the goal, is, is uh, helping somebody uh, on their road. We'll go ahead and skip this because I really want to, uh, well, okay, I got two more slides. I put this one up there because uh, <laughs> this is a national level conversation. This concept of, of the tension between different recovery strategies is, is a national level conversation. And I particularly love this, um, this article in the New York Times on, I think it was July, uh, January 1st of, of this year because of this picture. And this, this uh, colleague of mine who I dearly love, and, and Stephen Lloyd, and he basically is talking about his, um, his uh, treatment facility and the tension where this, he's trying to walk this line, right, for the, doing the right thing for the patient. And so uh, I think it's a fantastic article, but he's basically articulating that we just got to help them have a shot at living and help them get in a situation where they can recover long term. <clears throat> so you can do, there are some things that you can do re related to stigma. Um, there are therapeutic interventions for self-stigma, uh, for public stigma, big time communi uh, communication of, of uh, messages, uh, positive messages. And we got to include stories of people in recovery include stories of people in recovery because people can and do get better. And it is imperative that, that uh, they're, you know, when willing and appropriate out front and, and that people recognize that it's just like, it could be any of us, any of us or any of our children or moms and dads and so on. And relative to structural stigma, we can do some things related to, yeah, we can actually get, get educational programs in place and begin to have uh, conversations. So you heard about NAS a lot today. I'm going to skip through this a little bit. Um, we do have some reductions in NAS in the state. That's a very positive thing. And then I'm going to tell you about a community-university partnership because I want to help. I, I want our experience to be useful in some way at another place. And so uh, here's our story. Basically, in 2012, a colleague of um, and slash donor <laughs> to the university, uh, he convened uh, some folks at the university, and he said, "Hey, y'all, y'all have individual pockets of excellence related to the study of uh, opioids, and and uh, why aren't you working together? And why aren't you doing something bigger? What? Uh, why?" You know, you got medicine, you got public health, you got pharmacy. Why aren't y'all working together? And um, his name is Guy Wilson. He is a 
pharmacist, uh, and he owns pharmacies and nursing homes, but Guy convened us all in the vice president's office and said, y'all, y'all get it together. And so we, at that simple meeting, prompted a few of us to sit down and sort of think about who else needs to be here, who else do we need to hear from, who else needs to partner with us in order to do something significant about this problem. And, um, and we just started meeting and we did this uh, kind of simple, simple thing of just go ahead and scheduling those meetings. All right, we went out, we went out once a month um, and, and said, we're gonna meet on second Tuesdays from four to 5.30. So I know second Tuesdays from four to 5.30, right? I've gotta be at the working group meeting, right? And at first it was five or six or seven of us. And then it became like eight, nine, 10 of us. And then it became like 12, 15, 20 of us. And over time, what happened was some people would cycle in and then cycle out. Some people would sort of stick around. And, and what, what happened was this conversation started about what are best practices and what do we have in terms of assets and how can we take those assets and begin to move them and, and move, move the needle on this problem, right? And it was the simple, it was the, it's like the best accidental thing but it's the best time when I've been accidentally smart in my uh, life. When, when we started doing this and just had the simple idea of saying, okay, let's go ahead and schedule these things out. Because you get past, the for, you get past this kind of forum and you get down to stakeholders who are going to want to continually move something forward. And then the, here's the benefit of having the, the, the academy, the university. You get people who know how to search the peer-reviewed literature, right? You get their graduate students, <laughs> and, uh, and, you, and you move um, things forward relative to uh, best practices with that kind of, that kind of rudder of, of, uh, of you know, what, what are, what's happening in the national, at the national scene. And so at this point, we've got about 280-plus people on our on our uh, email list, this is a little older slide, but this is their, these are their sectors. Very diverse set of sectors. Here's where we need to do some work, some focused work, right? We need to build up our law enforcement connectivity, right? Um, and maybe dentistry too, but, uh, but law enforcement in earnest, and we're beginning to forge some partnerships in that direction. We've met monthly for seven years. I mean, yeah, I mean, every, there's a month or two where you're like, okay, there's only 15 or 12 or whatever people there, and it, and it feels like, okay, maybe the energy's going away. But then the next time you meet, there'll be 45 or 50 people there. And so what happens? We just committed to keep doing it. And, and all it takes, literally all it takes, is somebody being willing to schedule the meeting, host the list, and send out the email. That's it. And so out of it, you know, we... We're academics, right? We care about these really obscure kind of crazy things like grants and, and, uh, and academic papers and stuff. But, you know, I was counting this stuff up the other day because I, I was giving a, giving a presentation to somebody and I thought, you know what, I, let, let's, let's just inventory everything. Well, we've done 36 grant proposals. 17 of them have been funded for about 5 million bucks. Um, and it all started basically with this right here a $9,230 C grant to my buddy, Nick Hagemeyer, who is a genius. Uh, and, and Nick uh, got, this, got this small grant. He said, hey, Rob, let's write a paper, and then we're off to the races. So if there are any VPs for research in the room, is there a VP for research in the room? Anyway, this, this is a very valuable thing because over time, that has led to a whole lot of new uh, resources for the university and for other initiatives. We've done over 100 invited educational presentations. I think these 25 and 20 plus numbers are low. The, the 30 peer reviewed uh, publications is, is accurate because we just counted it up. We've done 14 in the past year. And, and so it takes a little bit of ramping up, right? And then you start moving. You get a little bit of momentum, a little bit of momentum. 
And all of it in partnership with our community uh, friends, colleagues, agencies, coalitions, right? Some of these grants that, that are up here were us working in partnership with uh, coalitions in the region to turn in a grant proposal on their behalf, right? Some of these were research grants. Some, one, at least one of them was an NIH grant that we got, and, and a whole bunch of the ones that we didn't get were NIH grants too. But uh, the, the point being that it takes just lacing your fingers behind your head, staring at the ceiling and saying, what can we do with this talent? And then taking that interprofessional group of people, learning from one another, and then leveraging all of that diversity of perspective and thought into something bigger. Uh, we established a center for prescription drug abuse prevention and treatment. Out of the center, we established Over Mountain Recovery and then the Opioids Research Consortium of Central Appalachia, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Okay, so you can kind of see how the working group sort of supports all of these concepts of, um, of the, our center and, and the different activities that we have going on in the, in the, um, in the community. Uh, here's kind of a model that we created to help make sense of the problem. It's strikingly similar to other continuum models, isn't it? Because this thing is so complicated that we have to be thinking about it like, okay, here, this is an appropriate intervention on this side of the continuum, and this other thing is an appropriate intervention on this other side of the continuum, and there is no one fix, right? There's a bunch of fixes, and we, all, we have to be engaged on a whole bunch of different things in order to be effective um, to mitigate the harm from both opioids but other substance use uh, disorders as well. So this is our sort of our big picture kind of model that we've been working on Actually, we first came up with this about six years ago, and it's really time to update it, frankly. Uh, but we published it last year in a pretty high-impact journal. Here's the thing. If we can get people back on this side, right, we not only save lives and misery, but we also have significant ROI, right? And it's almost linear ROI, right? So you can see the numbers that are over here are smaller than the numbers over here. Right, one dollar invested saves eighteen bucks, and and uh, and uh, one dollar invested—that's prevention, by the way, on the left side, right? Dissemination, implementation of prevention programs. So we got much better ROI on this side if we can if we can pull this off. So this is our model. This is kind of our framework that we use. We do a whole bunch of stuff in the community. I'm just going to click through this fairly quickly. Much of this is done by my colleagues, uh, several of whom are here. If you're affiliated with the center or the working group. Anybody affiliated with the working group here? How many people are on the email list? So we got maybe a dozen, maybe 15. And that's all the way down here. Is Ashley Browning here by any chance? Ashley? Is she here? Okay, anyway, Ashley was uh, one of our first graduate assistants. And I got to tell you, Ashley is starting the PhD program in sociology here this week at, at uh, UT. I'm so pleased for her. Um, we do all kinds of different uh, programs um, out in the community all the time. This is Angie Hageman, uh, who's the operations director for the center. Uh, we have a lot of um, uh, activities related to the workforce at this point. Um, Evidence-based parenting is a coalition-based program we've been uh, working on. Uh, this this uh, registry I was talking about earlier, where we have, is it 16 or 18,000 patient records at this point, Angie? 20,000 patient records now. Started with 20 grand, the gift from um, the Junior League. And, and basically, we just started uh, uh, pulling these things out from uh, the, the uh, database at Nice Warner Children's. And so the point being, now we have a spinoff group of the working group called the Neonatal Absence Syndrome Working Group that is beginning to dig into this and, uh, and you know, look for other funding and, and also do some uh, publications. Okay, <clears throat> stigma. So in 2014, 15, um, we were talking about treatment access in the region, and we had a fair amount of Suboxone, but we didn't have any methadone. In fact, uh, to get uh, to a methadone clinic, you had to go all the way to Knoxville or over to Weaverville, and that's across the mountain into North Carolina. And we were, um, we were thinking, okay, what if we could 
do a nonprofit methadone clinic? And what if we did nonprofit methadone and then we, the, the revenues that come out of the clinic, what if we shared them back with a center and for prevention and research, right? What if, what if it was more like a cancer center model from a med school? You know, if you think about it like that. So it's a, a, a comprehensive cancer center. You're going to have treatment opportunities at the cancer center. You're going to have prevention. You're going to have community um, outreach. You're also going to have um, a treatment clinic. And so what if we did something like that with, um, with a methadone clinic or, a, or, or substance abuse treatment facility? And so Steve and I were meeting uh, monthly. We were meeting at my, in my office at an ungodly hour in the morning because he was a physician in, in Johnson City at the time and, and uh, had to meet super early. And so I'd meet in there and we would draw some stuff on my whiteboard. And so we came up with this idea of a nonprofit. And so we were going to pitch it uh, at some point in the future, and Steve got impatient. He went over to the president's office for the, um, uh, for the health system and said, hey, uh, president of what would become Ballot Health, his name is Alan Levine, he, and Steve just kind of walked in <laughs> and said, hey, you need to do this. And so Steve began to lay the groundwork for the conversation that we would ultimately have with Ballot to talk on well, to, to pitch this concept, because we didn't have to do any talking. They were, they were all in as soon as we decided to do it. So anyway, we decided to start this uh, clinic, um, pull the trigger on the certificate of need, and then, and then we got a significant amount of controversy in the community. And I will tell you, uh, there feels like about half as many people in this room as we're at um, this meeting uh, where basically everybody wanted to tell us how wrong we were to do this. I mean, everybody wanted to tell us how wrong we were. And that whole line of people standing up over there, right, was, they're all basically, well, except for two of them, I think, who were in support of the clinic. But the rest of them were telling us how just what a crazy idea it was to do this clinic and, and decide it in particular to put it in the middle of uh, the Tri-Cities uh, because that's a, that's a largely uh, suburban area and no one wanted it in their backyard. Have you ever heard of NIMBY in my backyard? Well, this was a NIMBY fight. It really was. Uh, there's uh, Steve, backside of Steve right there. Uh, there's Dr. Nolan. There's uh, Alan Levine. This is a sheriff from Knox, Knox County Sheriff. Uh, there's me, and then there's Lindy White right there, and she was uh, one, of, one of our first. Uh, no, what? This is not, that was not Lindy. That was... Oh, it was Rhonda Coffey. Oh, my goodness, it's Rhonda. Rhonda lost her son to overdose. And, and when, during this meeting, during this meeting, people were basically shouting at Rhonda. She lost her son to overdose. And she said, you know what? If, if my son had had access to better uh, MAT, he might still be alive. And they were, and they were basically just, just telling her how wrong she was and I, I mean, it was driving me insane. It was nuts. I couldn't believe that people were saying this to Rhonda. She just lost her kid like six months before this. Oh, my goodness. But um, anyway, there was about 400 people there that night, I think. And after that, that was when Steve uh, had that 70 times 7 line uh, where he said, how many times should we let people try to recover before we give up on them? And Steve said 70 times 7. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of my favorite stories. So, uh, so anyway, there's our center. It's kind of a cancer center model like I described earlier. Uh, this is the clinic. This is Over Mountain Recovery. Uh, this is the group that uh, was really, <clears throat> well, let's, let's put it this way. So this guy on the right, Randy Jesse and Lindy White and myself, wound up being uh, the, the folks who did all the media uh, related to this because Randy represented Frontier Health, Lindy, Ballad Health, and, and me, ETSU. And then Tim Smythe, uh, one of my heroes, and Lori Street, one of my other heroes, uh, basically decided that they were going to help start it up and run it. And Lori's been the director of it since the very beginning. Lori, raise your hand, please. And uh, Tim, raise your hand, please. And uh, Tim's been the medical director from the very beginning. I called Tim and I said... Uh, we need a medical director for Overmount. And he said, okay. He didn't say, how much are you going to pay me? He didn't say anything but okay. Because he had been there from the beginning. You know, he knew what we were trying to do. <clears throat> so go to Overmount Recovery webpage and check it out. Um, you can see some details there. We've, um, 
our collaboration has gained some national attention. Now I'm talking back, to, I'm speaking back to the university professors here, right? So you can get publications, you can do grants, you can get those kinds of things if you just sit down with people in the community and listen and try to learn from their perspective, right? And hear from them about what they wanna do uh, with you. Um, we've been advocates for evidence-based uh, strategies moving forward. I'm, I'm, um, I'm gonna look at my watch for a second. And I know that I'm standing between you and the door, okay? I know that. And, uh, but I'm gonna take a couple more minutes because I, I wanna roll out a couple of ideas, all right? Interprofessional collaboration. In the absence of a cure, we should enhance interprofessional collaboration to prevent and treat opioid use disorder. And in our universities, we have an enormous amount of capacity to do this. <clears throat> These are just some quotes about, um, about the value of the working group for the uh, type of work that we have going on uh, in the, in the uh, community. And you'll have access to all these slides, so, uh, so don't worry about it if I'm going through them quickly. But there, here's three key messages. And then I want, to, I want to roll out three or four new ideas just to prompt some interest, okay? <clears throat> three key messages. Host, you don't have to lead. Just host them because once people get in the room, they'll start talking. Our working group meetings, hour and a half long. 45 minutes of that is, is basically saying, hey, I'm Rob, I've got this, these five things going on. And then Jason says, hey, I'm Jason, I've got these five things going on. And then by the third or fourth person, everybody's saying, oh, Really? Uh, well, I got this other thing going on. I could use you guys to, you know, and it just becomes a networking kind of a community of, uh, of ideas. <clears throat> so not just summits and conferences. Love the summits because they get people energized. Love them. But get the monthly meetings going because that will ultimately help you get stuff done. Start with aligning your efforts with evidence-based practices and then give your leaders time, space, and support to engage your community. This is really for, for academic um, administrators or anybody here that has folks like the faculty. If they want to get engaged with this stuff, give them some space because they're going to be creative and they'll figure out how to do this. So here's the new ideas. ORCA, uh, Opioids Research Consortium of Central Appalachia. Should be two Cs, but we like one. We just do it that way. Uh, this is funded by P. Corey. Uh, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and um, I'm the co-PI of this with my colleague at Virginia Tech, uh, uh, Kimberly Horn, and we have five universities, um, or six universities presently that are affiliated, and I want UT to be part of ORCA. It's Central Appalachia, and if we can get UT engaged with this, it'll be helpful, it'll be useful for a lot of reasons. We have, it'd be some good collaborations that can grow out of our partnership there. So. Whatever I gotta do to figure out how to get UT on board with ORCA, let, let's do it. We just started. So, and we're, and we're presently uh, submitting grants, um, basically using this infrastructure of the consortium. Uh, we're gonna come up with a blue, research blueprint for the, for the Central Appalachian region, and that's one of our deliverables to PCORI. Um, there is very likely to be either one or many opioid uh, settlements with the opioid manufacturers. It would be a really good idea for us to line up some, best, some good thinking about how those resources can be best used for maximum population health impact in the state. Um, so we need to be thinking about this. And uh, there are some documents out there about how to do this and, and uh, that, that's just another thought. You guys need to be considering what's gonna happen with this particular topic. It's a brand new idea. As of yesterday, uh, we were doing this uh, echo training thing, which I'll tell you about in just a second. But um, uh, Dr. Schmeith was was raising this concept of uh, methamphetamine in the clinic, and and so we're gonna we're gonna start a methamphetamine working group. And if you're interested in being part of that, we we'll, we can make sure that you have Zoom access to the working group meetings. We do this all the time. So if you're interested in that, reach out, and we'll put you on the mailing list. Uh, I told you about BMAT Echo earlier, but this is funded by the TenCare Care MCOs. Um, and ba basically, Echo looks like this. Um, you have the training, uh, people log on, and they get trained with the slides, 
and then there's a case presentation, and that's kind of how it goes. And that, so Echo is super effective and, and well-known to be so effective. So um, we're thinking about maybe using Echo for things like in the, in the court system. What if, what if we could do Echo for criminal justice, right? What if we could do Echo for uh, training of people, not, at, not in physician settings, but what if we could do Echo for training of people in behavioral health? What if, what if we could do it uh, up and down the continuum uh, for opioid use disorder and, and for other things as well? So uh, this is an idea that um, I think will begin to take some shape in, in the next, uh, next little while. You're gonna hear much more about this tomorrow, uh, sequential intercept mapping. Again, it's a continuum, right? Complexity, severity, right? So basically sequential intercept mapping is a proprietary uh, technique for identifying where people uh, interface with the criminal justice system and um, basically, uh, each, of those each of those is an opportunity to um, uh, engage with treatment as well. So sequential intercept mapping. This is, there's going to be training for trainers for sequential intercept mapping in this state very soon through the TJOY initiative. And um, Judge Sloan and I thought it would be a good idea for you guys to at least see this because, of, because it's going to be imperative for uh, the... Um, the work going forward, I think, out of this region. Um, the next one is the recovery ecosystem. This concept is being pushed by the Appalachian Regional Commission, and it's basically like, what are all those services that are coming together to support people in recovery later on, and how do we get them, how do we get people mapped onto the right kind of services, and then um, uh, help, help them for, engage with wraparound services, job placement, things of that nature. This is, this, is, uh, this is gonna be coming forward pretty soon. And the last thing, um, last thing I wanna say, prior to the acknowledgements and the thank yous, which uh, is the next slide. What if we could do this? What if we could take non, what if we could take nonprofit, office-based outpatient treatment programs, make them not nonprofit, or maybe even purchase some big for-profit ones, make them nonprofit, and then take some of that revenue and reinvest it right back into prevention in that community. What if Karen never had to write another grant? Can you imagine how dangerous Karen would be if she had never had to write another grant? Can you imagine? So what if we could do this and, and you know, do the appropriate scale of services, have the right kind of reimbursement, build this thing, build the system out such that the finances work to, for prevention? Because I'll tell you, the intractable problem and part of the reason that we're in this situation now is because prevention is not funded. Prevention has this fragmented uh, set of funding uh, mechanisms for which well-meaning and excellent agencies compete, right, all against each, against each other? They're good agencies with good ideas, right? What if we could get those prevention agencies fully flush with for evidence-based uh, program delivery in schools and communities, alongside churches, alongside all of those um, other good agencies, and they didn't have to just, you know, fight for two percent of the table scraps all the time, because that's exactly what's going on with prevention. Prevention needs a sustainable platform to help it thrive, right? And so uh, we had this idea, and I don't, I'm not going to quit till, some, <laughs> till somebody funds this thing, because, because right now, I mean, this, this would be expensive, but we're looking for foundation partners, we're looking for, we're, we got a grant going in on Tuesday, it's a big grant, and we're, we got a grant going in on Tuesday to try to get this thing funded. We're looking for, for agencies that will actually help us do this, try to expand these things into super high need areas not necessarily uh, compete where there's already adequate buprenorphine that's being done well. We don't want to do that. That's good. We want that to stay, right? We want to go into places where, the, where it's needed, maybe using mobile clinics and things of that nature, right? And then taking the revenues from that and putting them right back into the community with the partnering agencies. Is that possible? I think it's possible. We, we got to find the mechanism for it. 
So that's, uh, that's, that's the one that I'll probably, I'm not gonna give up on this one. So here's my last slide. Um, and I gotta say, the team is amazing. Uh, all of them. I'm, I'm so grateful to all of them for, their, for everything they do, tirelessly. Tim working tirelessly. Tim's working like six jobs, it seems like. I mean, he's you know, part owner of this clinic. Uh, this callus is doing great work, but he's also over mountain at like six, five o'clock in the morning, right? And he is just, I mean, absolutely hooking and jabbing to get it done. Steve Lloyd, I've never seen anybody work harder or, or go further uh, to, to get good information into the hands of people that need it. All these others too. This is, this is the, these are the core staff and, and faculty right here. Angie Hageman, Bill Brooks, Stephanie Mathis, and, and others, and, and I have great colleagues. But, uh, but also, I mean, the, the, folks, the folks at the top have said, okay, go ahead, and we'll stand right there beside you. When it gets ugly and controversial and people say nasty things about you, we got your back. And that was so vital, and it said so much about their character. So anyway, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to represent the center today, and uh, thank you very much for your time.